<laughs> so today we are with Drew at New Belgium Brewing. CSU has just implemented its own fermentation sciences. So this is somebody who actually brews for a living. Drew, how did you get started at New Belgium? What led you into where you are now? Um, well, I started out as a microbiology major at CSU. Um, and uh, I got an email from a professor saying that New Belgium was looking for a microbiology intern. And um, I applied for an internship as a senior microbiology major and uh, ended up getting the internship. And um, essentially just when I graduated, I was still an intern and I had to just kind of work hard and turn that into a job. And, and I did, and I've been here now, it'll be uh, four years in spring. So four years ago. Walk us through the process that a beer goes through as it's being made. Um, beer is uh, um, four ingredients um, uh, to make the most simple, you know, at, 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 at its um, heart, beer is four ingredients, which would be water, malted barley, or wheat, um, or really any malted uh, grain, um, and hops and yeast. So to make beer, uh, we're right. We're right now. We're in the brew house uh, of New Belgium. In the background, you can hear the the sounds of what it's like to make beer. Um, first, what you would do is you take malted barley and you would crush the the grain, um, open, exposing the uh, starchy insides. Um, and what you do with the crushed grain is you steep it in hot water, um, essentially like making oatmeal, only like really hot water. Um, and depending on the different temperatures that you would steep the grain at you get different uh, enzyme activity. Um, and the whole purpose of this first step that I'm describing, which is called the mash, is to take the enzymes that are present in the grain and convert the starches that are present in the grain, or using the enzymes, excuse me, to convert the starches into sugars. So the grain have enzymes naturally in them. They're called alpha amylases and beta amylases. And these um, enzymes will take the starches that um, are uh, created during the malting process and um, convert them into sugars that the yeast uh, way down the road will then turn into alcohol and CO2. So this first step, the mash, is, uh, is about creating um, sugar. And in the second step, you would uh, uh, lauder, which is where you would separate the uh, now sweet liquid from the grain. Um, and lautering involves um, uh, uh, a vessel that has a false bottom. So you bring in the grain water mixture, grain sugar water mixture, and um, you let the grain kind of settle out on the bottom. And um, the liquid will then fall through the grain and through the false bottom and be collected into a, another vessel. Um, and then you rinse the grain with hot water, which is called a sparge. And this is really to um, kind of get out the last little bits of sugar you can get from the grain. Um, and then now what you have is you have spent grain um, and you have sweet wort, which is um, you know this sugary liquid that you've created. Um, and then from there, you we send the spent grain to feedlots around Colorado and cattle will feed on that grain. Um, and then the sweet liquid is then sent to a boiling kettle where we will boil it and add hops. And um, sometimes, you know, we're a Belgian brewery, so we'll add spices, we'll add all sorts of different things. Um, you boil it for many different reasons. Um, one of them is uh, to sterilize the liquid. Um, another is to um, use the alpha acids that are present in hops um, to create bittering compounds uh, called iso alpha acids. So you isomerize the alpha acids with heat. Um, you also volatilize um, off flavors. So you get rid of off flavors. Um, you also caramelize sugars. You um, condense the liquid a little bit. So you evaporate off some of the water that you used uh, during sparging or rinsing of the grain. And then from there, you have a sterile, sweet, hopped liquid that you would send, um, well, first you cool it down, and then you send it to a tank. You pitch, uh, or you add yeast, and the yeast will then consume the sugars that you've created and turn those into CO2, alcohol, and, um, and flavor compounds. So that's brewing kind of in a nutshell. You were a microbiology major here at CSU. How do you? How does that tie into what you do at New Belgium? So, as a microbiologist, we have two main functions. Um, 
first is taking care of all the different yeast strains that we use. Um, so we use probably 20 different strains of yeast in this production facility. So we have to keep them separate. We also have to grow them. We have to maintain them. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, a lot of it is just encouraging them to grow and multiply. Uh, it's called propagation. So we propagate yeast. Um, and we also make recommendations based on how healthy the yeast are or not healthy. Um, and then the second part of what we do in the lab, uh, more or less, is um, co what's called contamination detection. So uh, beer is, um, uh, it should be free of microorganisms, but there are a small niche of microorganisms that can live in beer. And these microorganisms can play, create off flavors. So we spend a lot of time um, sampling the beer um, and taking those samples and using traditional microbiology like spread and streak plating um, and uh, some more advanced technologies like PCR to uh, determine uh, whether or not our beer is um, free of uh, beer spoilers and, um, and uh, if they do have beer spoilers in them then we spend time figuring out what those are and um, what course of action to take. So one thing to keep in mind is that um, pathogenic organisms don't survive in beer. They can't live in beer. The pH is too low. The alcohol is too high. There's not enough oxygen. So it's a very inhospitable environment for pathogens. So beer can't make you sick, but the, patho or the microorganisms that we are looking for can make the beer taste bad, and that's really all we're concerned about. It's just quality. Right. And what kind of microorganisms are beer spoilers? That's a good question. Um, the small niche of microorganisms that can spoil beer are wild yeast and, um, for the most part, uh, lactic acid bacteria, which are your, you know, lactobacillus or pediococcus, um, leuconostoc, things like this. Um, and um, yeah, they're all good bacteria too. They're all probiotic bacteria. It's something that you would find in yogurts. Um, they make, they use them in cheese making and fermented foods. So they're actually beneficial bacteria. Um, and microorganisms, but for our purpose, we, we're we looking for a specific flavor, and these things can create flavors that we don't want in the beer, like lactic acid, which makes beer sour. Um, Acetobacter is another one, which is a aerobic acetic acid producing bacteria. Um, and wild yeast can produce really funky flavors. Um, there's a wild yeast called Britannomyces that um, we use in brewing sometimes when we want those flavors, but for the most part, uh, like a fat tire or a sunshine wheat, we would rather it not taste like Britannomyces. Um, so yeah, those are the basic organisms that we're kind of looking for. How do you pinpoint the taste of a microorganism? Like, How do you know lactic acid makes a beer sour? Well, lactic acid is um, it's an organic acid, and um, lactic acid bacteria are very good at making lactic acid. They are um, that's kind of like, that's actually how they produce cellular energy. So they, in, they, um, we breathe oxygen to create, um, you know, to respirate. Um, and yeast can respirate oxygen. And um, yeast can also undergo anaerobic respiration, which is fermentation. And the byproduct of that anaerobic respiration is CO2 and alcohol. Well, in lactic acid bacteria, the same is true that they can, an they can respirate anaerobically, but their output is lactic acid. So they'll take in sugar um, and through a series of reduction reactions, um, output lactic acid and use that whole fermentation cycle as their respiration. So that's how they create cellu cellular energy, ATP, and that's how they, they survive and, and live. And so um, when you have lactic acid bacteria in your beer, um, they are most likely going to be consuming residual sugar and as a result, um, you know, respirating and creating lactic acid. And then if you have lactic acid in your beer, it's, um, you know, it's got a pretty low flavor threshold. It's pretty obvious when there's lactic acid in the beer and it'll, it'll just straight up, it'll taste sour. So, yeah. And we do it intentionally in some beers. Um, we have a beer called La Folie. We have a beer called Le Terroir and a beer called Eric Sale and some other sour beers like Tart Lychee that um, undergo an acidification process on purpose where we actually employ these lactic acid bacteria to create sour flavors um, because 
you know, a lot of people actually enjoy those flavors. Um, uh, and so we actually make a style of beer called sour beer that um, that employs those bacteria for that exact purpose. So, so that's how we know. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, uh, so you mentioned that as a microbiologist, you part of your job is to help grow different species of yeast. Um, could you? Is there um, like a difference um, between species of? like which ones you put in certain flavors or why exactly are you growing all these different kinds? Yes, so um, yes, the species of yeast is very important in creating flavors um, and in deciding what type of beer you want to brew. So at an extremely basic level, um, brewers like to separate the type of yeast that they use into two different categories, uh, an ale yeast and a lager yeast. Uh, these are two genetically different yeasts. They're uh, two different species that belong to the same genus. So the genus is Saccharomyces. The um, species uh, generally is, you know, ales maybe are Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and a lager could be, I've heard it called a lot of different things, but Saccharomyces pastorianus or Carlsbergensis. Um, and essentially these two yeast not only produce different um, uh, flavor compounds during uh, fermentation, but they also ferment at different temperatures they ferment at different rates. They, um, they do a lot of things differently that will create differences in the finished product. So knowing what these different yeasts do allows brewers to um, create something unique. So um, outside of just the ale and lager categories, um, you have subcategories, uh, ale subcategories and lager subcategories. Uh, the ale categories are probably more um, common you would have uh, Belgian ale strains, which are known for creating very fruity, um, very uh, aromatic compounds, um, esters, things that um, smell really nice, um, isoamyl acetate, ethyl hexanoate, things that are um, really pleasant. Um, lagers uh, tend to produce um, sulfur compounds. Um, a lot of them can be really high right after fermentation, and um, part of making a lager is to allow it uh, time to mature, or that's really where lagering comes from. It's, it's a process where you let the beer age for, I don't know, 80 days or so, and you're letting those sulfur compounds kind of leave the, the liquid so that they don't carry over into the finished product. Um, so ales tend to be uh, a little bit fruitier and um, more aromatic, and lagers maybe tend to be a little bit uh, uh, less aromatic, uh, less fruity, and they tend to take a little bit longer as well. So there's a lot of things that yeast contribute to the finished product that uh, that the common beer drinker might not think of, so. And so what exactly goes into mass producing or growing this yeast? It's pretty simple. So yeast uh, divide exponentially. Um, if you put them in the correct conditions, uh, which would be aerobic conditions um, in a sugar, um, uh, a sugary wort, which is that liquid that we make in the brew house. Um, if you put them into those conditions, they will tend to divide on their own very rapidly. So one yeast cell becomes two, two becomes four. Obviously, um, you know, it just it just goes on and on and on. And um, we can grow up yeast from, you know, a sterile loop, so like the the size of the head of a pin, to 80 hectoliters of propagate, which is uh, let's see, 80 hectoliters is 8,000 liters of yeast in a matter of uh, 10 to 12 days. So it really doesn't take much time at all um, if you give them the right conditions. So I know that you're looking for the fermentation process, or that's kind of what you're interested in when you're making beer. Um, is um, so why aren't why aren't you growing yeast in anaerobic? Um, conditions is it because of the acid that's produced as a byproduct or so yeast uh, yeast typically yeast actually require oxygen um, to make their own cell walls um, and uh, so when you aerate yeast or when you provide oxygen they'll divide and they'll multiply and as I was saying earlier under anaerobic conditions they will ferment so in aerobic conditions they don't need to ferment um, and create CO2 or alcohol, although sometimes they will, regardless. But 
Um, under anaerobic conditions, uh, they will, uh, yeah, convert sugars into CO2 and alcohol, but they won't actually multiply or divide. They'll just essentially, see, they, they prefer aerobic conditions, so when it's anaerobic, they're a little stressed out. And they're kind of like, all right, we just need to hang tight until we can find some oxygen. Let's just, you know, anaerobically ferment and stay alive, but nobody waste any energy making more cells. Just, you know, survive, essentially. Um, so yeast kind of can't really multiply under anaerobic conditions very easily. So that's why we do it aerobically, and that's why uh, fermentation is, is a thing. So. I know that New Belgium incorporates a lot of unusual flavors into its beer, such as citrusy type de things or yuzu fruit. What special considerations have to be taken when you adapt an unusual flavor into an alcoholic beverage? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, as a Belgian brewery or a Belgian style brewery, we um, have em always embraced using untraditional ingredients. Um, and that's kind of at the heart of Belgian beer making. Uh, the Germans historically have made beer only using uh, four ingredients of water, malted barley or malted wheat. Um, yeast and hops, and Belgians have always incorporated spices, fruits, um, honey, s syrups, you know, just really anything. Um, and our brewmaster is from Belgium, and uh, he loves to continue that tradition. Um, special considerations, uh, really, you know, why are you using it? What, what type of attributes are going to be, um, you know, perceived from this fruit uh, or spice or whatever? You know, what is the goal of using this? Um, and then in brewing, you know, um, special considerations need to be taken for, um, you know, on the micro side, like where are you going to add it? Are you going to add it in the kettle where it will become sterile and you're not going to worry about contamination? Um, you know, fruits tend to have wild yeast and, and, and microorganisms present on them naturally. So if you add them cold side, uh, which is what we say it's after the boiling process. Um, so cold side, you probably run the risk of uh, introducing microorganisms in back into the beer that shouldn't be there um, but uh, adding it hot side you you could kill them off and avoid that um, there's a lot of different things to consider but it's certainly a fun practice it's something that we'll always do uh, we make a beer called frambozen that uses uh, raspberries yuzu berliner weiss which uh, uses the uh, yuzu fruit which is a japanese citrus fruit um, let's see we use all sorts of stuff we use shisandra in um, wild wild double we use um, orange peel, coriander, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of things. Grains of paradise, a lot of different uh, ingredients. So, yeah. Does New Belgium ever have not as good luck brewing a flavor? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, it's all about what you guys want to drink. It's all about, uh, you know, it's not as much you know what we want to use as much as, you know, we try and make something that we think people will like but if people don't like it we we would consider that a failure we're not making beer for the sake of making beer we're making beer so that you guys can enjoy it and um you know i won't list examples of beers that didn't go well but there certainly are those styles and and certain ideas that maybe didn't go over so well and uh and you just try and learn from that and make better beer that uh that people really can enjoy and and that's what that's really what we're here to do so in what kind of conditions do you make an experimental beer? Well, we do we do eight, I believe we do eight Lips of Faith beers per year. So we divide the year up into quarters, um, two Lips of Faith per quarter. Um, and under, you know, essentially the brewmasters, uh, Peter and, and the assistant brewmaster, Grady, they'll get together and they'll have an idea and, and they'll uh, write a recipe and... We'll do a test batch and uh, taste it and see if we like it. And then if we like it, we'll scale it up and do a big batch. And um, that's pretty much, you know, how we do them. Uh, it's usually just an idea that uh, that gets turned into, uh, you know, a, a real live product. And then we send it out and see what people think. And hopefully they like it. Uh, I got one. Um, so you mentioned that a big part of the decision-making process in – um, adding non-traditional flavors into your beer is deciding at what point during the process to add them. 
Um, so when you're adding fruits, do you add them all um, typically in the same stage of the process, or does it depend on the fruit that you're using or the ingredient that you're adding? Yeah. Um, we, we kind of like to use uh, fruits on the what's known as the hot side. Um, so that would be um, anything um, in the brew house. So the vessels that actually, uh, where we mash and where we lauder and where we boil, like I was describing earlier. Um, so hot side allows us to use the fruit um, and uh, not risk contamination with microorganisms. Um, but there are things that uh, are important to add cold side um, without, um, you know, we add hops cold side. Um, and it's a process called dry hopping. Um, so you can add things cold side. You can add spices cold side. Um, although spices also contain microorganisms. So yeah, we, we actually, now that I think about it, we, we really do like to add all, all these things hot side for the most part. Um, I think that really uh, allows us, um, you know, the opportunity to both make good tasting, fun, experimental beers, but also not risk uh, quality that way. So, yeah. Um, and kind of changing gears a little bit, um, what does a typical day at the brewery look like for you? For me, it's, uh, it's I, I have a unique job. Um, I have a great job. But uh, for me, it's, it's a lot of... Um, getting things ready in the morning for running tests in the afternoon. So we have to sterilize a lot of our lab equipment um, because we don't want to, you know, give false positives or cross contaminate things. So in the mornings I'll come in, I'll, I'll make media, which is the stuff we use to grow bacteria. I'll make that, I'll sterilize lab equipment. I will um, go grab samples. Um, pretty much I use the morning to get ready for the afternoon. And then in the afternoon I will, um, you know, take those samples and run tests on them. Um, and then there's a little bit of time in the evening to evaluate those tests and kind of evaluate the results and just overall take a look at, you know, where we are and how clean things are and how well we're doing things. And, and then there's always fun, you know, and there's always opportunities to do fun stuff in the middle of the day. And, you know, you wander around and talk to people and learn and yeah, just a great atmosphere. And, you know, there's, you, I've never had the same day twice. Every day is a little bit different, um, and I'm really never sitting at my desk ever, so it's fun. I'm on my feet and, and making beer, which is fun. I guess I've got like one more question. So I know that Guinness places a lot of importance on the shape of their glass. I wonder if, does New Belgium take similar considerations? Yeah, I would say we do. The glass is important. Uh, a lot of what you perceive when you drink beer is actually your, the aroma. Um, that actually goes for all things in life. Uh, aroma is, is a key component in how you perceive what you're tasting and, and drinking. Um, so a traditional pint glass um, is great and it has um, a lot of uh, area, surface area, where the foam can um, release the uh, aromatic compounds uh, that are in the beer. Our glass is uh, in the shape of a globe. Whoop, there, you can hear it right there. Um, it has a stem that you can hold at the bottom um, so that your hands don't warm up the beer. Um, it, uh, it also has an, a laser etched um, thing at the bottom of the glass that's called a nucleation site. And that allows uh, the dissolved CO2 that is dissolved in solution to uh, nucleate and escape solution and turn into a bubble or a gas bubble and then go to the top so our glasses are kind of fun they've got a place where you can hold it so you don't have to warm your beer they've got a great shape for the foam to collect and release aromatic compounds and they also have um, you know a nucleation site where uh, foam can be created so they're kind of fun and they say New Belgium which is always cool so yeah and what imp what importance does the foam have in just kind of this whole glass, because you mentioned that it creates foam, and yeah. what does foam do? Foam is important in beer. Um, I would say at the heart of everything, it just looks awesome, and um, it just kind of is iconic in beer. Um, it is also important in, like I said, trapping the aroma of the beer and releasing it slowly um, so that when you put your nose up to the glass to take a drink, you 
breathe in the aroma from the beer that you spend so much time creating. Um, it, um, yeah, I mean, that's generally at the heart of it. That's what it's about. It's about aroma. It's about appearance. Um, I think it feels nice. You know, you can use different types of gases to uh, create foam. There's nitrogen, which uh, creates like a nitro, or what is what nitro beers use, like Guinness's nitro, um, nitro milk stout from left hand. Um, I think Odell's probably makes some nitro beers too. Uh, but we all use CO2, which uh, creates a bigger bubble. So nitro, nitrogen makes a small bubble, CO2 makes a bigger bubble. Um, they're different, but they both serve the same purpose, which is to release aroma. Well, this we are at New Belgium Brewing with Drew. <laughs> Drew, thank you so much for being with us today.